one of the things I really enjoy about philosophy is that you can bring philosophy anywhere you go, be it in thinking about the sciences, be it in enjoying nature, or be it in enjoying a nice work of art, such as music. Um, a little bit about Lou before I hand the baton over to him. Uh, Lou, uh, Professor Marinoff joined the uh, philosophy department at City College in 1994, I believe. Uh, before that, he did a um, undergraduate and degree in theoretical physics. I didn't know that about you, Lou, but that's that's interesting. Uh, and then did went and pursued a doctorate in philosophy at uh, the University of College London. Uh, he has written quite a few books, one of which is, I think, his most famous, Plato, Not Prozac, Applying Philosophy to Everyday Problems. Um, and his most recent philosophical book, I believe, is titled On Human Conflict, or the Philosophical Foundations of War and Peace. Uh, but at this point, I'll go ahead and, and hand the baton over to, to you, Lou, and let you say a few words about the project before we dive in. Well, thank you very much, Chad and Massimo, for hosting this and for allowing me to present uh, book one of a trilogy. Indeed, I didn't set out to write a trilogy. I don't think uh, most women set out to have triplets, uh, but sometimes it happens. You have one baby, you know, that's the norm, but sometimes it's twins and sometimes it's triplets. And in this case, I had triplets. Uh, it's only because the subject matter became so intriguing to me as a researcher initially that it developed into a trilogy. The trilogy is written. And it's being presented here partly because it was uh, partially funded uh, by a humanities enrichment grant from our division. Uh, the project was deemed worthy. It's an interdisciplinary project, obviously. It's book one of the life and times of a great but greatly unknown Spanish composer and guitarist named Fernando Sor. He was, was called, as you will see in book three, it's part of the title now, the Beethoven, Beethoven of the guitar. He was the first guitarist to take the instrument from the taverns of Spain to the great concert halls of Europe, and there's a reason for this. But the book uh, from conception in 2009 to writing uh, starting in 2018. It took nine years of research intermittently because the background of the book is the Napoleonic era. Uh, so here is a figure of tremendous stature who nonetheless grew up in one of the most tumultuous eras in Western history and also the era that gave rise to the great democratic revolutions just previous to Napoleon and hence the philosophy. Uh, so what we see with Soar is both a general thing and also a personal thing. In most general terms, we saw a huge struggle for democratic rights and for people having a say in their government. This transition during the American and French revolutions between the divine right of monarchs and the duly elected representatives of the people and the power struggles that ensued. And not only from those two revolutions, but post-Napoleon, this went on all over Europe. In some places, they were crushed like in Poland and parts of Italy. In other places, they were eventually granted, such as you know Holland and, and Belgium and so forth. Uh, the great powers were politically conservative, but more socially liberal. Uh, I'm talking about France and England at this point. Uh, Spain lagged behind. Spain was, was practically medieval in a lot of ways. And the relationship between politics and art is the thing that becomes philosophically interesting for us. To what extent was art shaped by the political and social conditions of the day? And to what extent were artists of the day able to reshape, reconfigure the political landscape? That's philosophically interesting. And also for Soar, it was a personal dilemma without betraying too much. You'll see it in the film in part one. His personal dilemma was that he was a reformist. He was a liberal. He was part of the Spanish Enlightenment, and you'll meet a few of those characters in this film. But they themselves were not interested in chopping off heads. They didn't want to overthrow the monarchy, and they didn't want to abolish the church. They wanted just to see reforms, meaningful social and political reforms, to give greater power to the people, but not destroy the institutions that govern them. But there was no such compromise possible at that time. So Soar, when, when Napoleon invades Spain and, and tries to impose these reforms, 
uh, through through the bayonets and cannons. Sore is torn. He wants Spain to reform, but he doesn't want the reforms imposed by an invading army. And this was a dilemma faced by thousands upon thousands of Spanish nobility, politicians, intellectuals, artists, tradespeople, ordinary folk. And in the end, as you'll see, they had to flee. They were exiled because history ruled against them temporarily. And this is part of the great tragedy of Spain. But if that had not happened, we would not have Soar's music. Okay. Uh, I can give you the verbal story. Yes, please. Uh, in, a, in a short form without, unfortunately, without the beautiful music. Uh, but first, let me paste the YouTube link or maybe Chad... Uh, you were showing it on YouTube. Could you please yeah, I can do my best here. YouTube link into the chat room? Sure thing. Um, that way everybody can grab it. The music is the thing, you know. Uh, the reason for the film, or one reason for the film, is that the book doesn't make any sound. And, and a book is strange, and this is another philosophical issue, is it not? Uh, the difference between a book and a movie, uh, notwithstanding the uh, preeminence of the visual cortex in the human sensory system, and secondly, the auditory cortex, everyone has an immediate gravitation toward visual and auditory stimuli, so radio is, is still alive, and films are very popular, always, but books have greater longevity. And there's another reason for that. I think that the uh, uh, the cognitive process in the long term, it's like gravity. It's the weakest force at short distances, but the strongest one across the large ones. And over great tracts of time, it seems to me, uh, classic books have an have a, have an impact on culture that no film uh, and no soundtrack could ever have. And partly it's because a book turns us all into producers of our own internal film. When you're reading a book, you're, you're generating images from text. You're generating sound from text. And so we have actually more say in the production uh, through the cognition of the literary medium than we have when we're passively watching images and sound imposed on us. Anyway, that's a topic for, for further discussion, but it's an important difference. So the whole motivation to doing a film like this was to be able to have the best of both worlds. So the book is out there. I wrote the book. I know what's in it. But then to capture uh, the elements that are sort of essential for understanding the story and to be able to present the images and most importantly the music so it could be heard was to flesh out or to complement what, what obviously the reading alone doesn't contain. And if you look at the video uh, at, your, at your own speed on YouTube, uh, you'll get a synopsis of the story and beautiful music that the book doesn't literally give you. And then hopefully you want to read it. But I think the book's much better. And I can't think of a single movie wh which is better than the book it was based on. Not one. Uh, maybe Casablanca. Uh, but not even Dr. Zhivago, one of the top grossing films of all time. These films are usually much bigger successes than people even know when they're making them. They don't often know they're making such a classic. They just make it. Uh, I still think Pasternak was better. Um, and so forth. That's for you to decide. But I think books have a power that, that none of these immediately... Uh, preoccupying media do have. So Fernando was a prodigy. Uh, I'll just tell you the story. I mean, he was he was recognized as a prodigy um, quite by accident. Um, his parents took him to the Italian opera at the age of five uh, because Italian opera was all the rage in Barcelona at the time. Italian opera was all the rage everywhere except in Madrid and Paris because they the Bourbon kings were in power and they the French forms were much more Teutonic, much more logical. Uh, they listened to Bach and Scarlatti still, and Haydn and Mozart, but they weren't into the emotive, beautiful uh, expression, expressiveness and the power of the Italian music. The English loved it, and the Spaniards loved it, except for Madrid. So they took Fernando to the Italian opera, and his mother on the way home was humming an aria. His parents were, were, were middle-class amateur musicians, like just about everybody in Spain. And his mother hummed an aria on the way home, and Fernando corrected her. And he, he said, no, no, mama, like this. And he hummed it perfectly. And when he got home, he disentangled the harmonies and taught them to his parents at five. So they discovered he had a perfect auditory memory. And they started doing house parties as a trio. Eventually, word of his gifts got out and the director of the Barcelona Orchestra offered to give him music lessons. So the, then he was exposed to violin, to piano, to harpsichord, to cello, to lute. And eventually he was recruited to join the Escolania, the choir of the famed monastery of Montserrat. 
And if ever you go to Spain, if ever you have a day free in Barcelona, you must go and visit Montserrat. Uh, they are uh, a thousand year old monastery in the hands of Benedictines for most of that time. Uh, they have, again, one of the most famous choir schools in Christendom. Uh, and they are absolutely beautiful. The film contains some extracts from that choir. And also, they shaped Fernando's musical education. They taught him lovingly, but strictly, with discipline. He spent six years there. He he was such a gifted person that he became a, the soloist of the choir. And he also became, at puberty, first violin. Uh, and then he graduated from Montserrat. And his mother found him a commission in the army. He was 16 years old. And in those days, a middle-class person aspired to a career in the civil service uh, or the military. It was peacetime Spain. Army was the stepping stone to both. Her social connections gave him a, a very junior sub-lieutenant's position in the army of uh, General Vives in Villafranca. Uh, and all General Vives wanted him to do was entertain the troops. So <laughs> he, he, they wanted him to play courtly music on his guitar for the officers and to play body barrack room ballads for the troops. And Fernando was very happy to do this in exchange for which the general gave him all the time he wanted to compose. So he spent time composing, and he composed traditional Spanish forms, such as the Segodian Bolero. And the film has beautiful examples. These are operatic arias. These are not just songs for the pop charts. These songs require tremendous vocal skills in order to execute. He also spent time in the library of the Barcelona Theater, and then discovered an old libretto uh, to an Italian opera called Il Telemaco. He composed a score at the age of 17, and to his astonishment, the manager of the Barcelona Theatre and the music director of the resident Italian troupe were so impressed by the score, they decided to perform the opera. And the movie has extracts from the overture. You can immediately hear in his 17-year-old opera, his maiden opera, you can hear his inf he, he very subtly weaves in influences from Mozart and Haydn, along with some distinctively Spanish touches, and always sore is the original voice. So you'll hear a bit of that. This opera became so successful in Barcelona that word spread to Madrid about this young composer. And in the year 1800, he was at that time 22 years old, born 1778. 22 years old, he receives an invitation to be sponsored by the Duchess of Alba, Maria Caetana de Silva, the 13th Duchess of Alba, and one of the most ravishing and notorious women in Spain. At that time, she was also the sponsor of Francisco de Goya, the Colossus, the, the, the last old master and the first modernist who was destroyed the Napoleonic era as a witness to all that was unfolding. And that to, at that time, he was the first court painter to King Charles IV, but living with the Duchess in her Lyria Palace. So Fernando is transported by this magic carpet to Lyria Palace at age 22, and the Duchess encourages him to write original Spanish music, which she loves, and also the thing that he's most famous for taking the guitar from an accompaniment to voice and turning it into a solo instrument suitable for the concert stage on its own. He was the first to do this. And he wrote orchestral works which really are compassed by the guitar, notwithstanding its small range and very short dynamic sustenance. He turns the guitar into a small orchestra, so much so that a little bit later, Debussy, Claude Debussy, after hearing Segovia play one of Fernando's masterworks, said, and I quote, the uh, guitar is not a small orchestra, said Debussy, the orchestra is a large guitar. So this was Fernando's great contribution, and he absolutely astounded the nobles of Spain with this. Unfortunately, the Duchess was in a precarious political position because she was rumored to be having an affair with the chief minister, Manuel de Godoy, a notorious character himself, who was corrupted by power. He was having an affair with the queen, Maria Luisa. The, queen, the king was only interested in hunting. He let the queen and Godoy manage political affairs, which were disastrous because he made a bad deal with Napoleon. And then Napoleon sought to chase the English out of Portugal to secure his rear against English incursion in the Iberian Peninsula so that he could then vent his ambition against Russia and invade in the east. So Napoleon made a deal with Godoy. Godoy allowed Napoleon to enter Spain with his Grand Armée, and the Spanish and the French together occupied Portugal. But this was only a ruse. 
Napoleon had offered Godoy one third of Portugal to rule as his own principality. He never kept up. He never kept his promise alive. As soon as they had annexed Portugal and marched the Grand Armée into Spain in March of 1808, Napoleon summoned King Charles IV, his wife, Princess uh, Queen rather Louisa, uh, his, uh, her lover Godoy, the chief minister, and the rightful heir, Ferdinand VII. He, Napoleon brought them to Bayonne and arrested them all. He deposed them and he, bull he bullied them, actually, into abdicating both father and son. And then he placed his brother Joseph on the throne of Spain. And in May of that year, Napoleon ordered his troops in Madrid to round up the rest of the royal family, the princes and princesses, and bring them under guard to Bayonne. And that provoked the uprising of El Dos de Mayo. That was the famous day, like July 4th in Spain, where they, they rose up against Napoleon, and it spread like wildfire. Now, Fra F Fernando was caught up in this. And this was essentially where he found himself during El Los de Mayo. But his story is a little more complex, and I'll tell you what happened to him. Uh, because the Duchess of Alba, back up now to 1804, the Duchess of Alba was poisoned. Nobody knows by whom. Uh, point, you know, too, rather. And she was, because she was suspected of having an affair with Godoy, and Queen Maria Luisa was madly jealous of Godoy. And any f woman that Godoy looked on for very long was banished, or, or worse. The king didn't care about any of this. All he wanted to do was hunt. And the queen saw the duchess's great rival for Godoy's affections. And the historians mostly think that she probably poisoned the Duchess. But Fernando lost his protector as a result of this. So Fernando was also then in danger because of his popularity. He was such a popular musician that he attracted women to his concerts, among other people. He attracted the women of the Spanish nobility to his concerts. And of course, Godoy patronized him to write music so he could concertize and attract more women so Godoy could womanize. This was the social setting. And so the queen got rid of Fernando by actually rusticating him to Malaga and putting him in charge of, and I'm telling you the historical truth, of the Royal Playing Card Factory. He was made an inspector of the Royal Playing Card Factory in Malaga on the Costa del Sol to get him out of Madrid so that Godoy would have fewer women upon whom to predate. This was all the royal scandalous behavior that was unfolding. But in Malaga, Fernando was then hired by the American consul, a remarkable Scottish immigrant named William Kirkpatrick, who had been appointed American consul by George Washington. He was a successful trader, a shipping magnet, and a very influential man with great business networks. So George Washington appointed this guy, and he hired Fernando to manage his house concerts. And his ambition with his wife, the Belgian woman, Francois de Grivigny, they wanted their daughters to marry into the Spanish nobility. And so they had attained Hidalgo status, the status of gentry, which they were able to do. And this made their daughters eligible to marry even the highest nobility. This is what they wanted for their three daughters. And when Fernando came to Malaga, they saw him as the master key to unlock the door because he attracted the nobility to his concerts. He was famous. He was brilliant. People loved to hear him perform. So by hiring him to manage their musical programs, they were able to attract some of the most important nobility in the south of Spain, where everyone vacationed in the summer. And there, their daughters all met their future husbands, thanks to concerts given by Fernando. And Fernando was also persuaded to give guitar lessons to their eldest daughter, a feisty nine-year-old named Maria Manuela, who was very good mu musically. And Fernando, thanks to this, this, this was a whole career change for him, because teaching this young girl planted in Fernando's minds the seeds of a method for guitar, which ultimately was published some years later and became the gold standard for beginners and still is. So his method was conceived in Malaga as a way of formalizing his instruction to this young girl. He also began to write studies for the guitar, and those studies have become didactic. Segovia recorded them all. I studied them when I was a beginner. Every beginner on guitar studies store. They're like Bach's 
two and three part inventions for keyboard. They're technically really, really good for development and they're musically so beautiful that even masters will play them. And so Soar occupied this hitherto unpopulated niche for guitar. And one interesting historical thing that came out of his four years in Malaga was that he had no inkling, no one could have, that his first guitar student, Maria Manuela Kirkpatrick, would later go up to marry, indeed, one of the great dashing grandees of Spain, uh, uh, a man named Cipriano de Palafox, a noble with many titles. And they had two daughters. And the youngest of those daughters, Eugenie, would go up to marry Louis Napoleon III and become the last empress of France. So Napoleon had no inkling, I mean, Fernando had no inkling when he was teaching this little girl, Malaga, that she was going to be the future mother of the last empress of France. So this was Fernando's karma. He, he had this tremendous uh, sway and, and this tremendous uh, ability without effort to connect himself to these historically important figures. So anyway, he gets caught up in El Dos de Mayo, and then an irony. I'm going to stop Massimo at about um, 120 and then open it up for discussion, okay? So I'm just narrating the film. Uh, he gets caught up in a really interesting irony. The Battle of Belen in uh, 1808 was um, uh, the first time that this uh, Napoleon's Grand Army had ever suffered, uh, suffered a defeat to this point on the field of battle. And it shattered the myth of their invincibility. So in Spain, the Battle of Belen is very important. There are streets named Belen, and every Spaniard knows the Battle of Belen. And it forced King Joseph and his marshal, uh, the leading marshal uh, in charge of, uh, of uh, Madrid at the time, I forget which one, one of, uh, one of Napoleon's big marshals, they are retreated, and the Spaniards reoccupied the capital. And Fernando wrote patriotic songs. And they marched back into Spain singing one of Fernando's most patriotic hymns. So this made him even more famous. But then Napoleon was incensed. He reinvaded Spain with reinforcements. He recaptured Madrid. And the, and the junta forced the military to lay down their arms and surrender to Napoleon, who reinstated his brother as king. And the Spanish people were so unhappy with this the troops had to surrender and did, but most of them melted away and became guerrillas or rejoined other regiments and continued the resistance. And anybody in Madrid of Spanish uh, descent who supported the Enlightenment values, who supported the ideals of the French Revolution, even if they resisted Napoleon's invasion, were branded afrancesados. They were branded traitors. This was a fundamental confusion that persists to this day. So if you were Fernando Sor and you were a patriot of Spain, but you were known to support the values of the Enlightenment and want them to be implemented in Spain, you were branded a traitor. And mobs and crowds that had sung his hymn to victory in August were now potentially going to tear him to pieces in November. And he had to flee the capital, along with, with thousands of his compatriots. He melted away and joined a regiment of volunteers in Cordoba, and he fought bravely for several years. Napoleon could not subdue the Spanish. He learned nothing from history, nothing. He, in fact, made the same mistake as the Romans after they had beaten Carthage and Corinth, and they invaded Hispania. Their legions were bled white there. That was many centuries before. And of course, the longest war in human history was fought in Iberia, right? After the Umayyad invasion in 711, 800 years of resistance eventually resulting in the completion of the Reconquista and the final expulsion of the Muslims from Andalusia, El Andalus, the Arab word. So Spain was a place that it was unconquerable. Napoleon paid no attention to this. At the height of his occupation, he had 300,000 troops and more than 100 generals in Spain, and he could never subdue the uprising, never subdue it. And in addition, uh, Wellington landed with his English army, his expeditionary force in Portugal, chased the French out of Portugal, eventually joined forces with the Spanish, and they eventually caused Napoleon to pull out of Spain. But in the meantime, Fernando, and his fellow liberals were so 
demoralized at the devastation of their homeland. Approximately 20% of the population died in that war, not of combat, but of disease and starvation and other privations. The land of Spain was way behind Europe agriculturally. They could not even sustain one army in the field. And there were four armies trying to live on their stomachs on the march. There was the French, there were the Spanish, there were the Portuguese and the English. They were all trying to live off the land and it was unsustainable. So they ended up robbing villagers. The soldiers of all these armies were out of control. Many of them became criminals. They were stealing food. They were pillaging. They were looting. They were raping. They were, they were turning against the people they were supposed to protect. It became such a nightmare that Goya depicted it in a very famous series of drawings uh, called The Disasters of War. And uh, those are shown in the film. You can, you can see them on, on, on Google or in the museums. The Disasters of War. Goya was a witness to this horror. So what happened around 1810 is that Fernando, among many thousands of Spaniards, were absolutely, uh, they could not any longer support the devastation of their homeland. And they said, how can we have peace? How can we stop this conflict? It was a very complex conflict because uh, the Portuguese were thought nothing of murdering and robbing their English allies. The Spanish generals were competing against each other. They would let the, each other be defeated separately instead of joining forces to win a battle. They abandoned their English allies. They allowed the English to fight battles alone and be slaughtered by the French. The French were out of control too. Fernando decided with thousands of his compatriots that they would swear allegiance to King Joseph and to his Napoleonic constitution. It was a secular constitution. It guaranteed rights and freedoms that were being brought to Spain as they had been implemented in France. It was a modern constitution, and all the Spanish liberals supported it. They didn't support the invasion, but they supported the document. So they actually, in the end, swore allegiance to King Joseph. History ruled against them, because when Napoleon became bogged down in Spain, Alexander and his Prussian allies and his Austrian allies saw an opportunity to violate the secret agreement he had made in Tilsit with Napoleon and, in fact, march against Napoleon from the east. So Napoleon had to take, in 1810, 100,000 of his best troops out of Spain and conscript boys from France. They had no more men. And that came the famous saying from Napoleon, a boy can stop a bullet as well as a man. He conscripted boys to serve, and he marched eastward. Napoleon was ever one to seize the initiative, you know, and choose the battleground. He won a Pyrrhic victory in Borodino in 1812, which was so ingrained in the Russian psyche that it later gave rise to Tolstoy's War and Peace, based on that Napoleonic campaign eastward, and also gave rise to Tchaikovsky's 1812 overture. That was the Battle of Borodino. Alexander retreated east, and burned Moscow behind him. Napoleon got to Moscow, but found it uninhabitable. No food, no fuel, no shelter. It was raised to the ground. So he had to go back to France in the teeth of the Russian winter, which was a debacle, complete debacle. He lost more than half his Grand Armée in, in the winter. Hitler later made the same mistake, learned nothing from history. So Napoleon's Grand Armée was shattered, and he had also been bled white in Spain. Uh, so his, 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 his ground army was totally decimated on both fronts. Uh, he was eventually deposed by the Acte de Chéance and the, the coalition. You know, they, they imprisoned him on Elba, all right? Then, you know, he escaped and eventually there was Waterloo, but that's after this tale ends. When Fernando had sworn allegiance to King Joseph and, uh, and supported the liberal constitution that Napoleon had instituted through his brother, Thousands of Spaniards joined the cause. But after Napoleon's army was obliged to pull out of Spain in the final defeat at the Battle of Vittoria in 1813, well, what happened was that the British general Wellesley, right, later the Duke of Wellington and Napoleon's nemesis at Waterloo, Wellesley was ordered by the British government to crush democracy in Spain. The British were still smarting from the American Revolution. They were angry, although they had many supporters. Britain was divided, too, over this, right? Many liberals in Britain supported the American Revolution, but the government of the day did not. The Regency government was against it. King George III was still alive. And Wellington was, was, was supported to crush democracy. So he installed the tyrant Ferdinand VII, who was the legitimate heir, but who had real problems and uh, was, was an absolute despot. 
And what he did was uh, he, he identified anyone who supported Enlightenment values, branded them as traitors, afrancesados, and expelled them from Spain. And those who didn't leave were imprisoned, their wealth was confiscated, many were put to death. So Fernando was obliged, to, through his own preservation, to escape his beloved homeland, and he joined thousands of refugees. He eloped with his childhood sweetheart, Joaquina, uh, and the two of them crossed the border. He bade his mother and younger brother farewell in Barcelona and crossed the border into France. And that is actually where book one ends. Uh, had he not been expelled from Spain, he would never have achieved the magnificent destiny that lay in store for him in Paris, in London, in Moscow, in St. Petersburg, in Berlin. He was going to become absolutely what we would today call a rock star, except he was a classical musician. He was going to attain that status throughout Europe, patronized by royalty, lionized by the nobility, adored by women, and loved by the masses because classical music was for everybody. And ballet and opera, which he also composed, were for everybody. The great halls that were being constructed were not the small Baroque concert rooms and palaces for 100 people. They were the great, the great public theaters like the Opera of Paris and other places with 2,000 people could come and enjoy the music. So this is what Fernando became. Uh, he would go on to write, I'm not going to spoil book two, but I'll just tell you a little bit. He would go on to fall in love with a French ballerina in London, and inspired by her, he was already became hugely famous in London, gave guitar lessons to Princess Charlotte, and, and, and was absolutely a celebrity there. He wrote the longest running ballet of the era. Nobody knows this about him. It was called Cendrillon, Cinderella. It received over 100 performances in the Paris Opera. Very few, only a handful of ballets ever received 100 performances at the Paris Opera. Cendrillon was among them. And because of that success, he and his then, he married, his first wife died in childbirth. He married the ballerina Felicité Hulun some years later, and they were both invited to Russia by Tsar Alexander. She became the first, the prima ballerina of the Bolshoi, and Fernando's opera was chosen to open in 1825, the new Bolshoi Petrovsky Theater, which was reconstructed from the ashes of the last fire, and they opened the theater under the patronage of Tsar Alexander with Cendrillon. That's how important, and Sor was court composer of the Imperial Court at St. Petersburg. That's how, how successful he was. And unbelievable what he attained. And it goes on. But that's book two and book three. Uh, but in the meantime, book one ends with his exile um, from Spain and, uh, and all of that story behind him and the great music that he left. And I hope you'll watch the video. Uh, Chad, did you put the uh, link in the chat room? You did. That's great. Um, I'm not sure you need all the index part, but I guess that'll work for people. I'm not entirely clear. Um, uh, it ends really technically before the and list. Uh, that's where my link ends, but uh, I'm sure your link is just as good. And I'll post, I'll put my link up there too. Um, or maybe you can just, that might work. I mean, you know, I don't know how these things are, but you could find it. Fernando Beethoven on the guitar, um, and it should be uh, viewable on YouTube. Uh, the book is also available, and I'll put the link um, to Amazon in there since we're linking things. Book one is there uh, in both ebook and paperback. And that's the link to, uh, thank you, Chad. That's the short link to the video. And I really hope you'll watch it. And, and the music is just beautiful. It, he was so versatile. That's the other thing about him. He, he, he says in his own autobiography written years later in Spain, in France, that he was, if one wants to understand the Spanish music, the original Spanish forms of his day, then he says, you should listen to my compositions. He doesn't say it as a braggadocio. He says it because it was, it was the pure Spanish music that he understood and preserved. He said it had already been corrupted by foreign influences at that point. So he was a pure composer of the, of the seguidilla, the bolero, the tonadilla, the traditional forms, and an originator of, of novel uh, versions of them. He took the guitar to the concert stages with solo performances, incredible solo pieces. Nobody had ever done this before him. Giuliani did it. A uh, contemporary in Italy was this, the, the other most famous one. Mario Giuliani did the same thing, but Sor was more famous. 
and he inspired what ended up with Segovia, taking it to the world. That's why we have Korean and Japanese and Chinese virtuosos today playing source music, as well as South American ones and people from all over the world playing source music and because of SOAR and then passing the torch to Segovia. So the legacy goes on, and there's more to come in books two and books three, a documentary about each, okay? I promise they're coming, but please watch this one, and you'll hear beautiful music of SOAR uh, from the songs, uh, beautiful songs to solo guitar music, to devotional music, to the overtures, to the Italian operas, to all the things that he wrote. And finally, if you enjoy the book, uh, uh, my hat's off to you. It's uh, 12 years in the making, and uh, I think it's the best thing I've ever done. So book one's out there. Um, see if it grabs your fancy. Thanks very much for listening to this long ramble. I would much rather, um, you know, a picture's worth a thousand words, and I, I, I hope you'll forget about what I just said to you and just watch the video. Thank you very much, everybody. Well, um, so at this point, let's uh, uh, do a little bit of uh, Q&A. Is there anyone that would like to start us off with a question? If you want to ask a question, just raise your hand um, in the upper left-hand corner. Uh, you can do that by going to the Reactions button at the bottom of the Zoom page and clicking the thing that says Raise Hand, like I had done just then. Uh, Massimo, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, Lou, thanks. That that was actually fascinating. And I know there's a disappointment because we didn't hear the music, but in fact, listening to you talking so enthusiastically about this thing is just as good as, as listening to the music. No. Which brings me to the first ob perhaps obvious question, but I'm curious. How the hell did you get into this project? Yeah, okay. Well, I'm how you got there and how, how did it evolve? I'm so glad you've asked. I'm so glad there's only a small number of people here, so I won't spill with <laughs> everybody. Um, and and I was hoping somebody would ask this uh, after the film. Um, but, you know, you're obviously so focused uh, that you're the one to come up with it. There are two answers. And um, uh, the so I'm going to give you the disingenuous answer first because it's the final answer. You have to read toward the to the end of book three. I tell everybody why. Uh, I'm the narrator. I have no. I have no presence in this. I'm a voice, right? I'm a. I'm narrating as I've narrated to you without me being involved. I've narrated about Fernando, and the trilogy is a narration about Fernando, and I'm not there. But I come into it, uh, you know, as a as a uh, under a pseudonym in the late in the, only very late in the third book, to explain how his partly how his legacy gets carried on, and um, I won't spoil it, but I'll tell you the truth. Um, I hope it doesn't spoil it. When I was a, a young man studying classical guitar in my earliest encounter with the instrument, I had a wonderful teacher. She was a mezzo-soprano. Her name is Florence Brown. She was a mezzo-soprano and a classical guitarist. She played Carnegie Hall. She solo Carnegie Hall in the early 60s. And she's from Montreal, where I am. Um, she was really the first Joan Baez. What people don't know is that, the second, that Joan Baez is really the second Florence Brown. She was so delightful. Uh, because she sang folk songs, but mezzo-soprano, and she played folk music, but classical guitar technique, that Columbia Records wanted to sign her. And, uh, you know, I mean, you could see that. It was the right time for this kind of thing, you know, for a female artist to take the stage and go on tour, as John Baez did so beautifully. Um, and Florence was too shy. Florence, despite her wonderful stage presence, was very introverted and didn't want the rigors of the tour. So she declined that. That's where they then they found Joan Baez. So she retired back to Montreal and taught guitarists instead. And a great prodigy of hers endorsed this book. I'm not her prodigy. The prodigy is Peter McCutcheon, professor of guitar at the University of Montreal, now just retired. And he taught me after her. He is the great protege of Alexandre Lagoya. There was the most famous trio of the mid-19th century, 20th, sorry, mid-20th to late 20th, is uh, Ida Presti and Alexandre Lagoya. I'm, I hope I'm giving you my answer. So I was introduced to SOAR via that school, okay? Mm -hmm. The yeah. Lagoya School at the Sorbonne, and their outstanding student in 1975, who's Peter McCutcheon, who was Florence Brown's great protege before I studied with her. 
And the graduation piece in 1975, you know, it's easy to get into performance schools, hard to get out of them. Conservatories are notorious in performance, easier to get in than to get out, right? And they all had to play the required piece that year. 1975, the required piece from the Sorbonne Conservatory was Fernando Sor's Variations on a Theme by Mozart, one of his wow. benchmarks for... So you see, Sor was there. Sor is still everywhere. And... Um, Florence said to me one day, to answer you, Massimo, uh, she had sent me away with one of his first studies, you know, for number five B minor, beginner piece. And I came back and played it for her. And she listened all the way through. It was very unusual because music teachers will always interrupt you. You can't get through a piece. Right. A master class, they'll sometimes embarrass you. They'll sometimes destroy you. They'll sometimes amuse, you know, amuse everybody at your expense. But you can never get through a piece. She always corrected me. She's correcting, you know, like any music teacher, your your interpretation, your position, your tone, your voicing. They're always correcting you. You have to learn that way. She listened without a word, a little study. And then she said to me, and I'm hearing it like today, right? She said to me, you have an affinity for sore. Huh. You have an affinity. She said that. And later, when I recorded... Uh, some of his music and it's on my CD David you've heard my CD there are two sore pieces and a music critic who knew nothing about me but he got the CD and he listened to it all five times and he noted the years because it's compiled from 30 years of recordings okay and he said and I'm paraphrasing this very esteemed music critic he said it was un it's unusual he said for such a young man at that time that I recorded so he said it's unusual for such a young uh, guitarist to have such a deep expression of Soar's grandeur. Hmm. Nice. So there's some connection between me and Soar, Massimo. Nice. I just guess there's a connection. And the deeper I got into his life, uh, the more I could really, I think, understand what he went through in some way. And it became not an obsession, but it became a really devotional mission to flesh out the book. And, and that's why it became a trilogy. Nice. Sorry to be so long-winded. Uh, I see David has his hand raised, but before that, I want to read a question from the chat from Sujin. She asks, why did you decide to approach this project as a novel rather than a traditional biography? That's an easier answer, Sujin, a very straightforward question. I'll be straightforward for once. Because the definitive biography of Soar has already been written, and by a friend and colleague of mine in London named Brian Jeffrey. Now, Brian Jeffrey has devoted his life to two guitarists, Fernando Sor and, Moro, and, and, and Mauro Giuliani. I hope I'm pronouncing that right, Massimo. The great Italian virtuoso who was of Sor's time. They're the two most prolific composers of the era for guitar and the two most famous virtuosi. So Brian... Um, and I'm going to type it in because he deserves this, Sujin. If you go to his website, it's called Tecla Editions. He has issued the complete works of Giuliani and the complete works of Soar. And there, he's devoted his life to this. It's magnificent. It's called Tecla Editions. Okay. And uh, his name is Brian. He's, he's British. He's from London. Brian Jeffrey. That's how you spell his name. Um, I'm typing it in the chat room. So he had written the, the, the definitive biography of Soar. It's been through three editions. And I read it. I, I, I befriended him. I played. He has one of the guitars of that era. I played it. I've met him in London many times. We've talked about this project. He totally supports it. And if you want to read a very detailed history of what's known about Soar, then you read Brian Jeffrey's book. But it's dry. It's, it's, it's pure biography with annotations. And it is not at all romantic or adventurous or exciting. It just narrates very blandly, if accurately, what Soar did. And it contains Soar's autobiography because Soar was invited later in life to contribute to one of the first encyclopedias of music to be issued in Paris by Ledui. And Soar was invited to contribute two articles. One, his own autobiography, which he wrote in the third person, of which he devotes two-thirds of 11,000 words to his six years in Montserrat. Interestingly enough, we get a beautiful account of Montserrat of the day. And the rest of it he wrote about the Bolero. 
And Jeffrey translates that into English. So you get all this very accurate stuff from Jeffrey. But, but so Jin, I saw a better story, not a better story, but a different story. I saw, I saw the romance, I saw the adventure, I saw the drama. And there were many, many missing pieces in the history. Many, many dots were not connected because we don't know the story. So I filled them in. And that's where literary license takes over. Where history is mute, creativity can speak. And so it became an inspiration to first learn as rigorously as possible the facts of the background and of his life, and then to fill in all these missing pieces with creativity. That was the joy. Okay, and that's why it turned into a novel as opposed to a to a, a history. I'm not an historian anyway. I don't know how to write history, but I know how to write creatively. So you can have a look at that. And there's nothing in there which is contrary to history. There's nothing in the story because I've invented only what fills in the gaps. Great. Thanks, Lou. Yeah. Uh, David, go ahead. Unmute. I said, Lou, this was admirable. Oh, David, you're too kind. I think it will be really great when you hear the music because I know how deeply you appreciate opera and other forms of that era. So thank you so much. But I can hardly wait to hear your feedback from the film, which gets uh, a, a wonderful overview, gives a wonderful overview of the different genres in which Soar composed at this time. I have two questions, neither of which I want you to answer or try to answer. <laughs> The first question is, how did we lose this sensibility? And my second question is, how do we get it back? <laughs> and I don't pretend that you should try to answer either question, but I think that this is a, a tr the, the pair of questions is tragic. You know, I won't answer it because I can't. And I, I know how important it is that they be answered and to make something up on the spot would be to insult the, the seriousness and the depth of the questions. And that's why I won't. But I will comment, at least in one way. Uh, we saw an interesting transition between the Baroque and the classical. The classical didn't last that long, you know. The music is with us in the biggest way, but the period was very short because the high Baroque really finished only, you know, very late uh, with Bach's death, probably you could say, and the Romantic almost immediately followed on the heels of, of, of Haydn and Mozart. Beethoven was the bridge. Yes. So if you look historically, yes, what you see is the following picture, that the Baroque was really a very rarefied elite music, and I'm not condemning it elite is not pejorative. Baroque music was above all serving two purposes. It was the music for the aristocracy and the nobility who, who patronized the composers. And it was the music also of the church because they composed of necessity and part and parcel of that picture of late feudal Europe. Really, they were composing masses, they were composing oratorios, they were composing all the devotional music. And they, so it was really uh, music that excluded the majority of people. Baroque music was not for the majority at all. It was not democratic whatsoever. It why was, wasn't it? Why wasn't, why wasn't it audible to those people? It would not have been played in the theaters. You see the musical instruments themselves, and now it becomes a musicological question. The instruments themselves could not play for large audiences. The harpsichord could not be heard in a concert hall. Okay. The okay. primitive violins and the primitive viola da gamba and those right. instruments, the lute, they could not be played in Carnegie Hall. They would not be audible beyond the third row. Okay. So they were played typically in small private gatherings at the country estates or the palaces or the salons of the well-heeled in the cities mm -hmm. and for very select audiences of maybe up to 100 people. And then comes classical music. Then comes Haydn. And with Haydn and Mozart come a new generation of instruments. The piano, you can hear it from everywhere. The new instruments, the winds and the woodwinds, everything gets modernized. Suddenly you can play to hundreds of people and they start building big concert halls. And guess what? People fill them because these musicians are taking popular themes. Mozart took Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. They were, they were taking popular themes that people knew and transposing them into orchestral works. We so now have magnification. 
and you we still have, can't, and we still can't make it. We it still isn't appealing, even with magnification. The people have diminished sensibility. Well, now it's a different part of the same question, you know, because we're only talking about the ancient transition, you know, relatively between the Baroque and the classical. And the classical was a brief flourishing of music for everybody. It really was music for everybody for a time. And then somehow or other, it became wrapped in a package that turned out to be as highbrow as the Baroque. It was it was sort of recaptured by ki various kinds of things that were perceived as elitisms, I suppose, uh, or were elitisms of one kind or another. And it was once again removed from, from the popular ear. And let's not forget radio and television and records. Let's not forget the huge amounts of money you could make by mass producing versions of popular tunes and marketing them as popular tunes. When I was young, there was the Bell Telephone Hour. There were a few, one or two or three hours of classical music a week that everybody with a radio could hear. And many people turned, turned it on. And um, it was Margaret Truman sang, I think, on the Bell Telephone Hour for the first time and was panned by a, a writer from the Washington Post. Uh, famously, and her father swore at the Washington Post music critic, uh, Perry did. But there was a time when there was at least an opening to the possibility. And now there is no opening. And I just, this last thought, I give away tickets to the New York Philharmonic rehearsals. Students won't take them. I know, I know. I, I want to give you an antidote to that, David, because it's uh, so something that I'm familiar with and you will be hopefully a little bit cheered by it. And I applaud your efforts. I mean, I understand and share a great many of your tastes musically. You know this. Uh, so, so I understand what you're speaking of. And, uh, you know, you could also say, or one could say more in our lifetimes, that it is really the advent of the notion of pop music, the notion of uh, I mean, Elvis Presley, in a way, changed everything. My parents listened to the big bands. Now, the big bands are a, class, are a form of the classic music of the time. You know, whether it's Benny Goodman or whoever, you know, oh, whether any of all, all those big bands, uh, yeah. all the great American big band leaders of every color, you know, in every constitution, they were doing something that was American classic music of the time. Yes. And it was also enjoyed across a spectrum of socioeconomic tastes. Yes. So it was also a kind of a reincarnation for a short time of classical music. It was music for everybody. Listen to the Benny Goodman concerts from Carnegie Hall in the late 20s. Sure. And Duke Ellington did the same thing. You know, and they made, and Louis, and Louis Armstrong, and they took music and they made it for everybody again. But they were taking very good music, by and yes. large, really good music. Yes, yes. So, so the next transition, you know, was the '60s, and we will spend another, another, another lifetime talking about that. So, anyway, David, I share all this. Let me just tell you before Natalia, I'll come to you, Natalia, um, about your about your uh, observation that you can't give these things away. You know, David, if if one piled up books on a street corner in New York, I don't think people would take them either. Frankly, <laughs> I would. Well, yeah, Chad, you know, present company accepted, right? I mean, if you pile up food, people will take it. If you pile up just about anything, I think that have any, any you know, people, I don't think books have that much value anymore either. So no. there is somebody you need to know about, David, and I'm going to introduce you to him electronically and anybody else who wants to be on his series. There's a, 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 a composer, or there's a conductor rather in New York City, an Italian conductor originally, he's American, but of Italian descent named Cesar Civetta, um, a good friend of mine now. And let me type his name in, and I will tell you what he's doing in a brief word, and then you will get the point. His name is Cesar. Massimo already knows how to spell, but I'll type it in. And what he has founded is he's the founder and musical director of something called the Beethoven Festival Orchestra. And I will tell you in a word its mission. If you know this much, you can go to their website. And if you want to be party to his films, every week he does a film on a great artist. That's how I got my inspiration to do this. And he does pop through classics, through opera, through everything. 
The man doesn't have a prejudicial bone in his body. He loves all great music of any idiom, as long as it's well performed. So he's done Heifetz, and he's done Barbra Streisand, and he's done Toscanini, and he's done Beethoven, and he is absolutely amazing. And go to this website, Google Beethoven Festival Orchestra. Caesar's mission is to return music to the younger generation that absolutely knows nothing about it. And he is founding an orchestra that is going to be diverse and is going to encourage more people from every background to get involved with classical music and contemporary music. And the tickets will be the same price as a movie ticket and not out of reach either for people. So he will start encouraging by example and by uh, availability and his mission is to get young people back. He shares what you want to do, and he has already a platform in the music world and a way to do it. COVID derailed him temporarily, but uh, he'll he'll be back with the Beethoven Festival Orchestra. So have a look at it. It's really a beautiful project, and he's a great guy, and he's no spring chicken either, but this is his mission. And he's conducted all over the world. He's a world-famous conductor. Okay. Natalia, did you have a question you wanted to Add. She has to unmute. Natalia, please unmute. Ah. Okay. Well, I guess somebody else has to unmute me. Um, so, um, is that a question related to David's? Uh, how do you think Fernandez's music legacy influenced music today? Yeah, and um, I guess what is the message through your no novel you would like to bring to contemporary music, musical aesthetic development, so to say? Okay, what was the first question again? How do you think Fernandez's legacy, legacy, legacy? How yeah. do you think Fernandez's legacy influenced contemporary music today? Oh, okay. Well, that, that's a more, I think, a more subjective question. Let me put it to you this way, um, that every classical guitarist knows Fernando Sor. If you're studying, you know, to play, just like every keyboard player knows Bach, you know, you're, you're going to encounter his music because it's didactic. And there's many Russian and many, many Slavonic guitarists or many people in the East playing. The, the first bit of music you heard on the video today was, before it cut out, was a very sp famous Spanish guitarist, Ricardo Gallien, but he's playing in Russia. He's playing in a concert live in Moscow, and he's playing Fernando Sor's Gran Sonata. And it's very deeply appreciated. So Sor's legacy, uh, which I will tell in part three, you have to, to go through this feat. This is only the early soar today. Then the middle soar is his huge success in London and his invitation to Russia and his grand tour on the way where he plays for all the great, you know, uh, kings and queens. And, and he meets von Goethe on his way to Moscow. He stops off. Uh, this is going to be also for some of you very interesting. On his way, he passes through Weimar and uh, he meets Goethe and they have a conversation. The most philosophical part of the whole trilogy is the meeting between Fernando Sor and Johann von Goethe, where, I mean, von Goethe was the, was the greatest mind of the age. Uh, and he understood very deeply the political conundrums. And they were living under something called the, um, uh, the, the Carlsbad Decrees because the German Federation cracked down on freedom of the press. They cracked down on freedom of speech. The further East Fernando travels, the less liberty he encounters. And he's being warned about this as he goes. Sar Alexander was delighted to employ him as the composer of the court. And he knew he was a liberal, but Tsar Alexander had this great affection for Spain because Spain weakened Napoleon so much that it made his invasion of Russia, uh, d d you know, defeasible. It was it was it was Tsar's uh, affection for Spain that led him to reward Fernando partly, and so Tsar had this tremendous influence beyond music. And what you get is that he handed it off. He inspired the next great Spanish pioneer, which was Tarrega. Okay, Francisco Tarrega is the torchbearer after Sor. And Tarrega inspires Segovia. 
and Segovia, who did not compose, took the music of Sor and Tarrega and all the Spanish music from pianists that he transcribed for guitar and took it around the world. But remember uh, that Segovia was also exiled during Franco's time. He fled Barcelona in fear of his life also. This is a twice-told tale. Segovia and Pablo Casals and many artists, there's so many from Catalonia. And George Orwell, who wrote the homage to Catalonia, was a volunteer for uh, the one of the international brigades, not the Stalinist one, the other one. And then they were going to be liquidated, so he had to flee. And all of these great artists of the 20th century from Barcelona had to flee a second time. History repeated itself. So part of the legacy of Fernando's music became the unfortunate legacy of Spain's civil wars. And his contributions to music rise above that, because all that people know about him today is that he's a name on a program. And in the introduction to book one, which I hope you will read, it's written by Santiago del Rey, who is a dear friend of mine in Barcelona, a great literatus in Spain. And he understood the story all too well. And he says in his introduction that if anything, what Fernando the novel accomplishes is it rescues this character from oblivion. And he thinks it's a magnificent rescue. He thinks that, you know, why, why do we know Bach's name? We're not keyboardists, but we know Bach, right? Uh, we're not guitarists, but we don't know Soar. Why is that? That's because of, of the quirk of history, which turned him into an exile. And even today in Spain, people condemn the Afrancesados without understanding the story. Even though Spain is now, by all accounts, a liberal democracy, they still think of the original supporters of Enlightenment values as traitors to Spain. When I was in Madrid doing research, this will really... I was in the library of the Biblioteca Nacional, you know, the main library, and I was taken in there. I was fast-tracked in there, and I went to the music department, and I said, you know, I'm just here for a day. Could you please, you know, show me to some resources on Fernando Sor early in my research? And the librarian looked at me, and he gave me a very nasty look, and he said, a francesado. <laughs> So this was the legacy of Soar in Spain. The cognoscenti, still some of them, if they're conservative, they think of him as a traitor. And the people on the street don't know his name. And yet he's one of the greatest cultural heroes that that country has produced. And that's why he's the Beethoven of the guitar. And you know, when Napoleon crowned himself in 1804, crowned himself emperor, you know that Napoleon was so angered by this that he defaced the, the dedication of his third symphony, which was originally the Bonaparte, because he admired the values of the French Revolution also. And he crossed angrily, he tore the page, he crossed out the dedication, and he renamed it the Eroica. And that was because of his incensement at Napoleon's coronation. So this is how history and art, how politics and art got mixed up together. Right, so I guess there, there is a political aspect and aesthetic aspect, and you are focused more on the first one, right? You, exactly right, Natalia, that's beautifully encapsulated. Um, the figure of this story is artistic, but the background is all political because they're, all their lives were shaped. Think about it. We today, everybody, David, even those who don't know anything about classical music, they know Beethoven's name. They may never have heard a note but they know his name, and they know Napoleon's name. And from that era, who else do they know? You know, the great unwashed. Everybody knows Napoleon, the, the adventurer conqueror. And you know what he said on his deathbed by repute? He said, there, there won't be, the world will not see another like me for 500 years. And I think the world breathed a collective sigh of relief, probably, and said, we can easily wait that long. You know? <laughs> but, but nonetheless, everybody knows Napoleon's name and everybody knows Beethoven's name. And that's the, there you go, Natalia, there's the artistic and the political, you know, which carry across history. Although most people couldn't tell you about Napoleon's campaigns and most people couldn't tell you about Beethoven's, you know, most important oeuvre, nonetheless, they know his name. But nobody knows Soar, and Soar belongs in that, my thesis is that Soar belongs in that category, and I'm not arguing it rigorously, I'm portraying it through, you know, literary fiction. 
Okay, thank you so much. Well, you're more than welcome. You're more than welcome. A lot of this is in Russia. And, and you know, book three is all about his, he was incredible the three years he spent in Moscow and St. Petersburg as court composer to the Tsar. And then he gets caught up there in the Decemberist Revolution. This guy had a talent for being in places where history was being made. He was in Madrid during the Dos del Mayo. He was in, 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 in London during the Battle of Waterloo when everybody was tearing their hair out because no one knew. You know, if Napoleon had won, it was a very thin thing. The Prussians just appeared at the last moment to save the day. You know, Wellington said it was a near-run thing. Had they lost, Napoleon could have invaded England. Might have. And he was also in Moscow. He was in St. Petersburg during the Decemberist Revolution. He witnessed it. And then he was also back in Paris during Les, les Glorieux, Les Trois Glorieux, when they deposed the last Bourbon monarch. He was right in the middle of it. He was giving a concert when the cannons went off. So, like, Fernando was, although a musician, history grabbed him at every possible turn and ensnared him in its politics. Very interesting. Thanks, Lou. Oh, you're more than so welcome. So I, I want to have the privilege of ending our session here by posing a question. Um, I'm wondering how you um, understand the relationship between the kind of historical, political, um, music aesthetic work that you're doing in this project uh, to your work in philosophy. I mean, there, there are some views that might see no relation at all and no relation possible. I'm reminded of a quote from Iris Murdoch that she gave in a BBC interview with Brian McGee, where she said, philosophy is certainly not self-expression. Philosophy, of course, is argument. You can say, well, is the conclusion true? Is the argument valid? And that's it. <laughs> So I'm wondering if you have a different view of this, if maybe there is a self-expressive element to philosophy um, as you understand it and how this project relates uh, to that. Well, you know, we, if I may uh, tell a, I don't think it's a state secret, uh, but we were on the verge one year of hiring a very, very famous continental philosopher. I mean, we needed one and, and we had an opportunity to hire, you know, Dennis Schmidt, um, he's a he's a you know a great scholar and uh, a great scholar, uh, very famous guy. He's at UPenn, and um, he came in to my office uh, prior to during his campus visit. And we start. I was chair, so he met with me, and then you know we had the all, all the compulsory hoops we jumped through. But we were talking about this, and uh, he he was asking me the same question about my work, Chad, because he had, he I don't just write philosophy if, if what I'm writing is philosophy. Um, and I don't think it's just argumentation. I think it can become that it, through the uh, through the lens of, of analytic philosophy. It can become argumentation, um, and and even through some of the more um, analytic styles of continental philosophy. Certainly, if you're writing about Heidegger critically, you're you're, you're writing argumentation without a doubt. But uh, but I do think that it's much more, and that's why Iris Murdoch doesn't just write philosophy, surely. And it's so well known in in the domains other than philosophical, right? Uh, and, and many philosophers, not not all, but many philosophers. Look, Hobbes Hobbes translated Thucydides. I mean, we could we could go on and on, right? I mean, Camus is noted to be an existentialist, but he didn't write philosophy. He wrote novels. I think that that philosophy paints with a broad brush at the end of the day, and that whatever a philosopher does could be construed as being philosophical. But what makes that a philosopher a philosopher? I don't know. And I said to Dennis, and Dennis was saying, you know, um, you have an interesting department, uh, which we did, and we do. And I said to Dennis, yeah, we do. And he said, and you're, you know, you're the chair. And he said, this is, you know, it's a very interesting attempting to join. And I said, yeah, but Dennis, I'm not sure that I'm a philosopher. And and he and he looked at me and he said, you know, I'm not sure I'm a philosopher either. So so maybe that's the answer, Chad. If we start to try to define what a philosopher is. <laughs> We may have a very interesting philosophical discussion, or maybe one that doesn't qualify as philosophical at the end of the day. I, I leave it to you. Thank you hey. for that. Looks like David has a finger on this one, and then we'll wrap up. Un unmute, please, sir. Unmute, David. <laughs> David? Ah. I want to suggest that we would do the City College of New York a big favor. If we would do this again with the music department when we assemble as a college on campus in an open meeting 
um, where we might do two or three of these. We might do SOAR. We could do um, anybody they want, anybody they propose, jazz, whatever. And we would provoke, promote, provoke sensibility. It wouldn't be our, it wouldn't be philosophy as theory. The aim would be explicitly sensibility. Um, provoke, promote the cultivation of sensibility. And that might be the best thing philosophy could do. Well, David, I, I applaud it and I endorse it. And I'd, I'd like to collaborate on such an occasion when we get back to our new normal, because just to su summarize this, basically philosophy is, is, is surely at the foundation of the humanities. Historically, it is. But it's not only philosophy. And we need to reach out and remember our connections to the aesthetic it's it's it, we philosophy is also music it's also architecture it's also art it's also all of these sensibilities so Dance. it's natural for us to have an interdisciplinary approach at times in addition to our own specializations and yes. that's part of what has excited me about this project because i had to learn some history and I was a terrible student of history in school. I hated history as a subject. I was no good at it. But it was it was a treat to absorb the history to paint the painting, right? That was a, that was a joy. And to retell the history to people in a way that excites them, that was a joy. And I had to learn a lot of musicology along the way and a lot of art history. When you're taken on a tour of the Lyria Palace, my friend, which you are, as Sor sees it for the first time, when you're taken on a tour of Montserrat Monastery, as Sor sees it as a young boy, I was on that tour. OK, that's that's where I absorbed the details and transmitted them. So philosophy can do this. I think philosophy can serve an integrating function across the humanities, across the disciplines, and give us that much more appreciation of history, of music, of art, and of all those things without being explicitly philosophical. Let me just mention that a previous president, a surprising one, Lisa Koiko, uh, was herself astonishingly supportive of music and dance for a, for a time. Mm -hmm. Now it's there is no support. Oh, yeah. We have to promote this. We can. And I think we could. And we could. And we would be more effective than currently we are were we to try. Right. Well, David, I think this is a marvelous inspiration. And if that's what grows out of this, then we have a lot of work to do in a constructive vein and also in promoting more awareness among our students of the value of interdisciplinary approaches from time to time, since they're all being pushed into over-specialization. Massimo and Chad, I think we could further discuss this later. And also when Ben takes over, bring him on board. We could have such an event. I would like to show the Fernando film and then have a live and then have a live discussion with people from music, history, English, and anybody else under the sun, engineers and computer scientists too, Absolutely. everybody under the sun. Absolutely. Let's expose them to this. And to show them that we are an active pole promoting, provoking this. Absolutely. Sounds Absolutely. like a plan, people, but we need to wrap it up. <laughs> yes, thank you very much, Lou. Oh. Uh, this an was, unexpected this was a piece. Pleasure. I love it. Thank you thank so you. much for having me and also for your tremendous engagement with this. I didn't plan on turning it into a talk, believe me. But but I hope you'll watch the film. It's much better in a certain sense. And 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 please give me some feedback on it, okay? And if you want to read the book, I promise you're in for a treat. Thank, thank you, you very much.